Uh, if you have a collection of ancient documents there that we Christians tend to call a Bible, can you turn with me this morning to John chapter 3? Get ready at John chapter 3. Before we read that, I just want to pray for us. So Father, I thank you, Lord, for God, the amazing things that you have been doing in our midst, Lord. And uh, Father, the testimonies and the stories, Lord, the, the, God, the little movements that are taking place in our lives, Father, as you mould us into your image. And Father, as you equip us and you motivate us, Lord, to, God, not just be people that say to you, gimme, gimme, gimme. But Lord, as we become people that want to be poured out, Father, as we become people that want to make a difference, that want to contribute to the work of God in the earth, Father, we don't have, our life is a drop in a bucket compared to eternity. Lord, what the time you give us down here is nothing compared to the time we're going to have back with you. So, Father, as you continue to mould us and encourage us and stir us up, Lord, to pour ourselves out to make the most of this time, Father, I just pray today, Holy Spirit, would you open our ears to hear what it is that we need to hear? Would you open our eyes to see what it is that we need to see, Father? Each of your kids that are here, Father, would you speak to us this morning in a language that we individually understand and just take us that next step on that journey, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Hey, I was with um, a, a youth with a mission school this week at Byron Bay. I, I go into different YWAM schools at different stages and, and spend a week with a whole group of international students and talk about different topics. And the particular topic this week was the topic of re-entry. So they have just done a six-month training school with YWAM, discipleship training school, and this was their last week. At the end of this week, they jump on planes and jump in cars and so on, and they all head back to their homes, back to their nations that they come from. There were Europeans, there were um, uh, Asian, people from Asian nations, uh, America, uh, Canada, all kinds of, of nationalities were represented in the room. There was about two Australians, I think, and they'll be jumping in their car and driving home. Mostly were international students. But at the end of the four days, I had uh, one of the girls uh, ask me on Thursday afternoon before I left, can I sit down and have a chat with you? And so we did. We sat down on the stage here. Everybody was in the room. It wasn't just the two of us. Um, and so we're sitting down, and she began to share this story with me. She had had an encounter with the reality of the person of the Holy Spirit during her school. She said, I came to Australia and the third day of my discipleship training school, she said, I gave my life to the Lord on the third day. Here I was, she said, I was brought up in church my whole life. And I came over here and the third day of my school, I gave my heart to Jesus. And she said, from that point on, the Holy Spirit began to move in her life. She said, I know that the Spirit of God has been doing things and transforming and changing me. I know that. It's tangible. She said, when I went on outreach, she went with a team, I think it might have been to Indonesia. And she said, when we were on outreach and we, we prayed for the sick and, and so on, we saw healings and we saw the Holy Spirit move and we saw all this stuff happening. And then she just broke down in tears and she said, but my problem is this. She said, I'm about to go back home. And she said, my church does not believe in the Holy Spirit. My church does not believe in the Holy Spirit. So, okay, so when they read about the Spirit, she said, no, we breeze over it. We just kind of jump over the Holy Spirit. And so there's no talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. There's no reality of the Holy Spirit. And then she said, the thing that really struck me was that when I was back at home, uh, back at where I come from in my church, and I won't mention the denomination, but I know this denomination She's right, they don't believe in or talk about or experience the Spirit. And, and, and she, she said, when I was back there, she said, although I was going to church, she said, my, my, I knew there was something spiritual about the world. I knew there was something more than you can see, taste, touch, feel and smell in this life. I knew that. And so she said, I went searching for that. And she said, nobody at home knows this, but I was involved in witchcraft. And she said, the reason I was involved in witchcraft was because there was a very real power in that. And I t- tapped into something that in me I knew was always there. So she said, when I came across and got born again, she said, I experienced the power of God and I realised this is the real spiritual truth that I've been looking for. This other stuff is a deception and, and a lie and so she's, she's running after Jesus. But she said, what do I do? I'm going home now. I can't deny. This is what she said, I can't deny the reality of the Holy Spirit's work in my life. I can't deny the reality of the Holy Spirit's presence in my world. And in tears, she said to me, I don't know what to do. Would you pray for me? And I gave her a little bit of advice because I've, I've sat with many people in that situation before and, and I shared some testimonies of what some other people have done that have, have had to go home in situations like that. But it just reminded me again, and struck me again, that the power of the Christian life is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Right? We take the Holy Spirit out 
of the New Testament church and you just have a bunch of people doing their best. They're doing their best with, with the level of intelligence that they have at the time. They're doing their best with the level of strength they have at the time. They're doing their best with the level of resource they have at their fingertips and the level of opportunity presented to them and the level of open doors that swing open in front of them. That's basically all that we've got in this Christian life if we think that we can do this on our own. If, how, many of, how many of you have ever tried to change? You've just, you just knew that you shouldn't or that you should and you want to change and so on. And, and we, every 12 months we have this thing called New Year's resolutions. And we come up with the same thing and I want to change in this area and I'm going to stop that habit that I can't break. I realised in August I'm not going to stop it so I gave myself four months grace and said, don't worry, keep going. December, d- d- January 1, that's when I'm going to stop it. And you got there and you lasted two weeks and you're back into it again. Or that thing that God said to do and you said, I'm going to do that and you started in your own strength to go, look, I really want to do this. I want to be this person and it maybe lasted two weeks, a month and then after a while, bang, we fall back to being the same person that we were in the same rut, doing life the same, thinking the same and living the same. Now, now the good news is this, that, that when we read the New Testament, it's very, very, very clear to me, very clear to me that Jesus never intended for New Testament believers to just try to do this whole thing in our own strength. Amen? We can't do it in our own strength. I can't change myself because if I'm going to try to change myself in the power of my own flesh, my own flesh doesn't want to change. That's why I am the way I am. It likes it. Right? So I can't beat myself with myself. I need something else to be at work in me and to move through me and to come into play in my life if I'm going to be anything like the kind of person that this, these New Testament documents tell me that I should be. If I'm going to do anything of the things that the Holy Spirit has spoken into my life and over my life from when I came, if I'm going to do any of that and walk in any of that, I'm not going to be able to do that just in my own strength. And and this young girl, when I sat there listening to her, I thought, you know what, it's so important. It's just so important with all the attacks and everything, as we've been speaking about for months, the stuff that's coming against the younger generation. This is another thing that we need to be careful of, that we don't present a Christianity that's just all about our own efforts, our own intelligence, our own abilities, that we don't give them a a, a vision that Jesus saved you, now you just got to suck it up and do the best you can. One day you'll be in glory and it'll all be okay. Jesus said, I won't leave you as an orphan. Jesus actually said to his disciples, he said, "Uh, it's to your advantage that I go. Because if I don't go... The counsellor, the spirit, the helper, he will not come. So Jesus said, it's, it's advantageous for you. And at the time, you can imagine the disciples are thinking, it can't be any better than this with Jesus here. But Jesus himself is saying, guys, I've got to go because it's better for you. I've taken you so far, but man, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And it's going to be better for you as a church and as individuals and as followers of me than if I was to just stand here in your presence for the rest of your life. It's going to be better for you. And we need to be careful that we continue to bring the Holy Spirit into our expression and our experience of our faith. Because Jesus made it very, very clear. He said to the disciples, he said when he resurrected, he said, go and and, and wait. Wait till you receive power from on high. Wait until the Holy Spirit has been released, then go and do the things I've called you to do. And from that point, not only did they do what Jesus called them to do, but they began that process of transformation in becoming the people that Jesus wanted them to become. Because up until that point, when Jesus was taken, I don't need to go into it, we all know what happened with most of those disciples. Peter stands here and says, everybody else may run from you, Lord, but I won't. They're all cowards and suckers, but not me. And then a rooster goes, caca, caca, caca. And Peter ducks his head, breaks out in tears and walks away and realises, geez, I talked a big game, but I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And Jesus goes, that's okay, I know you couldn't do it. But wait till the Spirit comes upon you. And that same man stood up in front of thousands of people, looked him in the eye and said, here's the deal, that Jesus who you crucified, who you handed over. And he just gave them both barrels of the gospel. John chapter 3, verse 1 to 12 we all know John 3.16, right? The most well-quoted and well-used Bible verse. John 3.16 says, For God so that... Yep, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have 
everlasting life. John 3.16. And we know that John 3.16, it was Jesus himself speaking to, or being quoted and speaking to a guy called Nicodemus. Exactly right. But if we go back and have a look at what's going on here, it's not so much one guy coming to Jesus at night with his own personal uh, agenda and questions and one guy answering back. If you have a look at the text of it and you read the conversation... This whole John 3 is about two different groups, distinct groups of people. It's about a group of people that do not have the Holy Spirit and then another group of people that do have the Holy Spirit. Look at the language and listen to what they say in John 3. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, who knows? Is it up there? We know. He says, Rabbi, we know. He's not just talking about himself. He says, Rabbi, we know. See that? He's talking on behalf of a group. He come to Jesus at night, but he says, hey, you know what? We know. There's a group of us and we know. We know. This is not just my, me, but maybe there's been some conversations that have gone on amongst the other leaders. And they've chatted about Jesus. You know, look, I don't understand. Yeah, I know, but no one can do the miracles. Yeah, I know that. We're we're confused. How about Nicodemus? Do you want to go to him and can you have a chat with him and let's see what you can find out? And so Nicodemus goes representing not just himself, but a group of people. If you go to John chapter 12, there's an interesting passage in John chapter 12. It it, it actually says that there was a group of, of many leaders, it says. Many of the religious leaders and people believed in him, but it says, but they would not confess him for fear of being removed from the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So there's this group of people, and they do, they are starting to go, we think this Jesus thing could be right. And so Nicodemus, as, almost as a representative, goes and sits down. And this conversation is about two groups of people. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replies, he says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asks. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. And then he says this. He says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. To which Nicodemus says, how can this be? Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher, and do you not understand these things? I mean, you've got it all going on up here, and you don't get this? Come on, you know the scriptures. You've memorized more Bible verses than most people. You know. How is it that you don't get this? And then Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, we, as in those that have the Spirit, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? So this is a conversation, not just between two individuals, but but, but Nicodemus comes representing a group of people and Jesus is speaking. He uses the we, we, we language as well. He's speaking about another group of people from another perspective. It says this. It says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound... But you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Here's what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus. He's saying, you people who do not have the Spirit, you're going to hear and see those of us who are led by the Spirit, but you're not necessarily going to get us because we don't lean on the same type of understanding as the rest of you. We trust in God and we follow his Spirit. You see the wind. You know there's something happening. You know it's blowing somewhere. You don't need the Spirit of God to know that. And you see it. But you don't get it. You don't get it. Bottom line, here's what he's getting at. He's saying this, in plain English, the Spirit makes our life different. The Spirit makes our life different. He impacts the way we live, he impacts the way we think, and he impacts the things we do. And those without the Spirit will not fully understand that because we don't live the same. We don't lean on the same understanding. We we don't follow the same promptings. Our life is different. When it's lived with Jesus. Luke chapter 4. 
uh, verse 1 and verse 14, there, there, there's a, a, a little interplay here. Two, three things that are mentioned about the Holy Spirit when it comes to the life of Jesus. I don't want to flesh this out too much today, but, but I have in the past, and we'll, we'll do it again one time. But here's what I want you to see. Luke chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Everyone say full. Full. So Jesus is filled. He's full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit. Everyone say led. So he's filled with the Spirit. And he's led by the Spirit. And if we go to verse 14, we all know he goes into the wilderness, he's tempted and so on. And then verse 14, have you got that there? Verse 14 says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So he's filled with the Spirit. Then he's led by the Spirit. The first thing that happened when he was filled with the Spirit is Jesus had to learn how to be led by the Spirit. And when he learned how to be led by the Spirit, that was the place where the power of the Spirit began to flow through him. And here's the thing. God does the filling. Right? Romans tells us, Romans chapter 8, I think it is, tells us, if you've given your life to Jesus, I believe you have the Holy Spirit. Right? Paul says in Romans, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not saved, bottom line. So if you're sitting here going, but I don't speak in tongues, but hey, that, that, that's a secondary thing really. Uh, it, it's not the, the only evidence of you being filled with the Spirit. Jesus is very clear. Uh, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, this promise is to everybody. He said, repent and, and, and believe the gospel will be baptized and you shall receive the promise. You and your grand and every generation will receive the promise of the Spirit by faith when we bow our knee and give our lives to Jesus. That Spirit will come and live in us. So God gives us the Spirit. And then if we go to step three, the power of the Spirit, well, it's not our power, it's God's. It's the power of the Spirit, right? But between step one being filled and then step three being poured out, we talk, we, last week we looked at John 7. John chapter 7, where Jesus said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. And he spoke that at the last day of this ceremony where they poured water, this water pouring ceremony, where for seven days they would fill up a jug and walk and they would pour the water in a specific place. It had to be at the base of the altar. They would pour it there. It wasn't being poured anywhere. It was being poured specifically in a place. In other words, they were getting the water filled and they were led to a specific place to pour themselves out. And this is the picture that he's talking about. It's that as we learn to be led and we begin to pour ourselves out, it's not just... If you, could, if you could just heal the sick, right? Then you would be a very cruel person to say, that's my power and ability, I can do that. But waste your time sitting in here, you should be at the hospital. You should be helping people. There are people in there struggling right now, dying of diseases that medical science can't fix. So don't waste your time sitting in here, go down there. But you're smart enough to know it's not your power, right? But what happens when the Spirit of God leads you and says to you, hey, I want you to go and I want you to... And you have that sense of faith, you're being led to that place. So... so, so the Spirit leads us to the right place to pour ourselves out and to pour the power of the Spirit out. And that's what Jesus said. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would receive, for the Spirit had not yet been poured out. Jesus was talking about pouring out the Spirit. And so God fills us, and it's God's power. But if we want to be people that know how to move in the power of God and see the power of God moving through us, I'm talking, when I say power of God, I'm not just limiting it to laying hands on the sick and healing them. I'm not just talking about knowing that there are people that are under demonic bondage and being able to go over there and, 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 and take authority over those spirits and deal with that. I'm talking about being able to sit down with someone and say to them, hey, Jesus loves you, and say it with such conviction and passion and authority that they can't but ignore it. They can't ignore it. Instead of they just sit there and go, yeah, well, that sounds great. I'll think about whatever. When Jesus spoke, they recognized something, and they said, this man speaks as one who what? Has authority. So, so when Jesus spoke, there was something on his words that weren't on everybody's words. Right? Jesus made this statement. He said, I only do the things I see my father doing. I'm only saying the things I'm hearing my father say. He goes to the pool of Bethesda and he heals one person. The pool of Bethesda in John 5, I think it is. It's an ancient hospital. People are scattered all around there. They're sick. They have this belief that an angel is going to come at some point stir the waters. When the angel stirs the water, the first person in the water gets healed. So there are a plethora, always wanted to use that word in a sermon, there's a plethora of bodies at the pool of Bethesda. They're all over the place. Why does Jesus only heal one? He's only doing what he sees the Father do and saying what he hears the Father say. Jesus was led by the Spirit. And if we want to be people that express the Spirit through us, if we want to see the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do, and if you don't want to do it for yourself, can I encourage you, be that kind of person for the next generation so they can see it in you. Do it for the next generation so they can see, okay, so this Christianity... See, uh, uh, if we're not being led, if we're, if we're, maybe you're here today 
and, and maybe you're a bit like that girl and the Holy Spirit's this ethereal thing and you don't sort of know how to take the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I pray keep your heart open. Don't, don't close your heart off. Because there's a couple of things about the Holy Spirit that we cannot avoid. Number one, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit. We can't avoid that. And if Jesus is my Lord and Saviour, then, then, then I've committed myself to following him. That means everything that he said means something and I'm trying to follow that. John chapter 14, 15, 16, go and read it. He speaks a lot about the Holy Spirit. So we can't avoid the fact that Jesus spoke of the Spirit. Secondly, we can't afford the fact that Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit as being a person. Personhood, not as a force. Like uh, you know, Luke Skywalker, may the force be with you. The Spirit is never, ever mentioned, ever, as some, some, some force. The Spirit is always spoken of in terms of personhood. That's why you can lie to the Holy Spirit. You can't lie to a force. That's why you can grieve the Spirit. Because the Spirit has emotions. That's why you can resist the Spirit. Right? Every time the Holy Spirit's spoken about, it's in the context of being like a person. That's what Jesus meant. That, that when I go, he said, another one just like me will come. Another one just like me will come. Only I'm here in bodily form. The Spirit's going to come in spirit form. So, so you might not be able to put your fingers in the nail holes, but he's going to be there and he's going to be just as real in your life and in your presence as what I was while I was here. It says, full of the Spirit. He left the Jordan, he was led by the Spirit, and then he returned in the power. So God does the filling, God releases his power through us, but what we need to do is be that linchpin in the middle, and we need to be people that want to learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit. How do we be led by the Holy Spirit? You see, the Spirit leads us. He leads us in some of the following ways. He leads us into evidential giftings, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We read about all these gifts of the Spirit. They're, they're not just ethereal things. that we. No, these are practical things that are happening right there in real time, in real space, being expressed through the lives of people that follow Jesus. And the Holy Spirit leads us towards discovering those giftings and flowing in those giftings and so on. Uh, the, the Spirit leads us towards producing evidential fruit in our life. Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, 22, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on. faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. For such there is no law. You never know that song. Really. Maybe the Spirit gave it to me one night. I, for some reason, that's a song in my head every time I think about the fruit of the Spirit. But anyway, I sort of throw it out there. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is real. It's evidential, right? It's evidential. And, and so the Holy Spirit leads us to produce this evidential fruit. The point is this, that the Holy Spirit leads us to very real and tangible places and experiences. He leads us just as if I was standing in front of my wife and I said, hey, I want you to come with me, let's go. And she'd have to choose to obey, but so do we with the Spirit. So he leads us to evidential places. The Holy Spirit brings about change and transformation. He leads us to places where there's power released, where there are healings. He leads us to places where miracles are released. He leads us into wisdom that we don't naturally have. He leads us to fruitful places for the gospel. He leads us into places where we get to share our faith and share our testimony and our story. He leads us to open doors. He leads us into supernatural dreams and visions. He can lead us even supernaturally and instantaneously from one physical location to another. He did that in the book of Acts chapter 8 with, uh, was it Philip? Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine uh, I was talking to somebody this morning and I was talking about getting baptized, his son getting baptized and I spoke to somebody on, on Thursday night about baptism as well. Can you imagine if, if it would be pretty cool if I took you down there and I baptized you and I put you in the water but then when you came back up I was gone. Imagine that. that. Well, that's what happened in, in, in to the Ethiopian eunuch. He, he's baptized and bang, and it says when the eunuch came up, he was gone. Philip was gone. Transported about 32 k's or something away, and bang. Imagine being Philip. You're like, your hands are wet and bang, and the next thing you're in the middle of a marketplace in Azotus, and you're like, what? That would have been a bit of a trippy experience. But it happened. It happened, and it was the Holy Spirit that did that. And we could go on and on and on about the things the Holy Spirit does in the New Testament. We can go, if you read the book of Acts and read all the experiential and real and valid true things that the Holy Spirit does. Most of what the Holy Spirit does bends my brain. It bends my intellect. I don't get it. I understand it. But if you talk to somebody that's been deeply entrenched in the New Age movement, they'll go, yeah, we get it. Talk to someone that's coming out of witchcraft, they'll say, yeah, we get it. You talk to someone that's coming out of a lot of Eastern religions and, and, and occultic practices, they'll go, no, we get it. We get it. We know we don't, we don't have an intellectual problem with the fact that there's real power and experiential encounters that you can have spiritually with the dark side. We don't have a problem with that. But sometimes in the church, we do struggle with it. We do struggle with it. We struggle a little bit with that to get our head around it. 
Now, here's the thing. The Spirit always walks in the same direction as the Word of God. We know that. So the Holy Spirit's not going to take us outside the boundaries of the Word of God and the character and the nature of God. We know that. But the Spirit is also committed to glorifying Jesus too, don't we? We know that as well. So, so, so some of us, I think, uh, if we kind of open ourselves up too much to the reality of the Holy Spirit, if we were to crack a door in our heart and say, okay, God, here's the deal. I know, I know, I cannot escape the fact that, 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 that you said it was advantageous for us that you went and that you would send your Spirit. I know, that you, uh, I know that your Holy Spirit is here to speak and to guide and to live. I know that your Holy Spirit is a very real person and a very real presence. So I know that. But if I was to crack my heart open just a little bit, it's amazing how many believers are afraid. If I crack my heart open, the devil will dive in that doorway first before God does. And so for many of us, we go, well, I'm not going to prepare to take that risk. And so we keep the door shut. Maybe we've seen a whole bunch of fruit loopy stuff in the Spirit. Yeah? Guys on all fours barking like dogs and running around snorting like pigs and all this. And look, I've seen all that kind of stuff. And I ask myself the question, is Jesus getting any glory out of that whatsoever? Is his bride getting any glory? You know, are we looking like a bunch of nut jobs or are we actually looking like a bunch of people that may have the answers to the deepest questions of life, you know? Of course, there are extremes and there are weird things that go on and so on. But we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, do we? We, 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 we want to be people that follow Jesus and we've got to look at the words of Jesus and we've got to take seriously the teachings of Jesus. And when Jesus speaks about the reality of the Spirit being not just a force but a person that's ever present with us, we have to wrestle with that reality and ask ourselves the question, what difference does that make to my life today? What difference does that make to my life today? So Jesus made it very clear that the Spirit was a real person who would be a very real presence with a very real purpose the early church believed this and on the back of this belief they went out and they actually turned the world upside down they didn't do it because they were smart enough or talented enough charismatic enough strong enough organized enough popular enough or they were loaded with resources they did it because they had an inclination towards the spirit because they had an expectation the spirit would lead and they had a motivation to follow the leading of the spirit and i guess that's the question that i want to ask us today do you have an inclination do you have an expectation and do you have a motivation to want to be led by the Holy Spirit. John 16, verse 12 to 14, here's what Jesus said. He said, I have much more to say to you, to his followers. He said, much more than you can bear right now, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. That means something, doesn't it? He said, he will guide you into all truth. That meant something. He will guide you. You you could replace that word in the Greek with lead. You could say he will lead you. He's going to take you somewhere. He'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own. He'll only speak what he hears. So the Holy Spirit is hearing things from the Father and then passing those things on to you. Think about that. The Holy Spirit is hearing from the Father. And what he's hearing, he's taking and he's passing it on to you. It's like when you... you, Anyone watch the State of Origin on Wednesday night? Yep. State of origin. You know what happens? There's, there's, there's guys sitting up in the coaches' boxes, right? And they're in the coaches' box, but the players are down there on the field. They can scream and yell all they want. Those players can't hear a word they're saying, right? So what do they do? They pick up this little piece and they go, hey, tell Freddie to run left and tackle harder or don't be so soft or whatever, you know? They give their instruction and that goes down to a person, a, a trainer, standing on the sideline. And the trainer gets that message and the trainer runs out in the field and says to the player, hey, harden up, take a teaspoon of cement, get up, stop talking. You're getting paid good money for this. Come on. Or whatever it is that they say. And that's the picture we're getting here. That it says the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, he will, he, will, he will hear from me and he'll pass it on to you. He will not speak on his own authority. He'll speak only what he hears and he'll tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will then make known to you. So the Spirit's receiving things from the Father and making them known to you. Here's the thing. If the Spirit is hearing from the Father and receiving things from the Father with the intention and purpose of giving those things to me, I want those things. Amen? I want those things. I want to know how to hear. I want to know how to listen. I want to know what His voice sounds like. I want to know how to open myself up to that. I don't want to be in fear. Some people, if they open themselves up to the reality of the Spirit, have more faith in the devil's ability to deceive them than they do in their Heavenly Father's ability to keep them on track. We're more worried, we're more afraid that the devil's going to get in there and I'm going to end up all loopy and twisted and so on, and you don't realize, no, 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 your Father is way bigger than the devil. 
Your father has his hands on your life. And, and, and Jesus said, this is how it's going to work. The Spirit's going to, I'm going to send, I'm going to give things to the Spirit. The Spirit's going to pass those things on into your life, through your life and so on. So trust me. Trust me. You can open yourself up to the reality of the Holy Spirit. And don't be afraid about that bad stuff because you've got a father in heaven that's got his arms around you. He's not going to let you get deceived because you've stepped out in faith and trusted something that Jesus said. He's not going to turn his back for a brief minute and let some demonic thing get in there and twist your life up and bend it out of shape. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But we need to make the decision and ask ourselves the question, are we inclined, are we expectant, are we motivated towards the Holy Spirit in our life? Jesus said he'll guide you, he'll lead you into truth. He's going to speak that which comes to him. He's going to give us wisdom that's beyond the reach of ourselves. But yet the Spirit will bring it to us. How many of you know that we face things in life where we need direction? We need answers. We need perspective. We need wisdom and all this stuff that is beyond our scope and our reach. And sometimes we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go, what to say, how to respond. And we need something beyond our human intellect and our human emotions and our own human limitations. And these are the types of moments where as believers we can lean on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. If you, as a good parent, if you had an answer to a question, if you had some wisdom or some guidance to offer, would you want to pass that on to your kids if you knew it was going to help them? Then why do we, think, why, why do we feel it's so hard to hear from God? Why do, why do we question whether God really cares or whether God would, like, would want to answer that or whether that's really, you know, is that a big deal to him? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Spirit to those that ask? We have a loving and a gracious God that wants to be very involved in our world. He does. If he didn't want to be involved in our world and it was enough just to know stuff, Jesus would have said, it's advantageous for you, to you for me to go away because I'm going to give you a really great book. I'm going to give you this awesome book full of my words and that's just going to be enough. But for some reason, in the economy of God, the Father felt that the Bible itself is not enough by itself. I'm going to send the Spirit as well. And there's something about the Spirit and the Word that work together. If you have the Spirit without the Word, you'll end up a loopy flakehead. Right? And, and who hasn't seen that flaky stuff? Way off here, you're way away from the Word of God. I've seen it. They're barking like dogs and cackling like chickens and... You know, I've seen crazy, crazy, crazy things over my 30-odd years of walking with Jesus. Weird stuff that in no way brought glory to the Father and, and, and confused me more than anything else, you know. I've seen that stuff. And that's what happens if you get rid of the Word and it's just Spirit. But you can go the other extreme too. You can drop the Holy Spirit out and just go with the Word and you can end up with the driest, legalistic... Yeah. There's no life in that. God's not dumb. God's very smart. That's why he says it's both. Yeah, I, 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 I want the Word and the Spirit. When you bring those two things together, there's life in that. There's answers in that. There's solutions in that. But the question is, are we inclined towards the Spirit? Do we have a bent towards the Spirit? I'm going to wrap up now. I'll, I'll, I might just get the band to come back. I want to finish with that song we started with. It was a great song. I'm, I'm going to unpack this a little bit more next week. But here's the thing. I want you to think about these three things. I'm going to ask you three questions. I want you to think about them. Am I inclined to want to be led by the Spirit? Sounds like a silly question, but it's really not a silly question. Some people don't want to be led by the Spirit. I'd rather be led by my own emotions. I'd rather be led by my intellect. I'd rather be led by the culture around me. I'd rather be led by my best friends. Are, are we inclined? Is there something in our heart where we want to be led by the Spirit? Second question. Am I expecting to be led by the Spirit? I mean, Jesus said in John 16, this is what he will do. The Spirit will take of mine. He will give it to you. Jesus said he will guide you into truth. He will lead you. This is what Jesus said he would do. Are we expecting that or are they just words on a page? Are they something we just brush aside or like this young girl I spoke to this week? Is it something that theologically we just bypass those words? We put them in the too hard basket and pretend that they don't mean anything. Jesus said this. He said he would speak. Do you feel like you're the exception and he doesn't want to speak to you so you have no expectation about that? Do you expect to be led by the Spirit? Then the third question is this. Am I motivated to follow the leading of the Spirit? Am I inclined toward the Spirit? Am, do I want to be led by the Spirit? 
And if I want to be led by the Spirit, am I expecting the Spirit to lead me? And if I'm expecting the Spirit to lead me, am I motivated to actually do what the Spirit says? On the surface, we'd all say yes to all three of those things. But if you dig a little bit deeper, can we really answer yes to all three of those things? And maybe next week we'll, we'll continue on with this, or week after actually. Continue on with this and we'll unpack that a little bit more. When I, I want to dive into those three questions. Inclination, expectation and motivation. Because you see, I believe that the Holy Spirit is the very real presence of God. And, and I live in a community, in a world where I want to do so many things, but I know I can't. I live in a world. Some years back, when I was in YWAM, I took a, a, a bunch of students. I was running these things called Schools of Evangelism in Brisbane. And we were going to this thing called a Spirit Soul Body Festival. Some of you might have heard of them. They've become really popular for a while, kind of died down a little bit now. This one was being held at the convention centre at South Bank. It was huge. I was taking an outreach team there, and you know what I did? I got in a bus with a bunch of, you know, we were only all in our late teens, early 20s, you know, just none of us knew anything, but we loved Jesus, and we just wanted to go and tell people about him. So I said, we're going to go down two days to the Spirit Soul Body Festival. We're working with a local church, and we'd hired a tent, a, a little um, tent thing in the, in the um, convention centre, right? Now, I got lost because I didn't have a GPS on my phone or anything. I didn't have a phone or anything even back then, way back, uh, would have been early 90s, mid 90s, something like that. No, early, early thousands, 2000s, yeah. So anyway, I pull up where I think it is and, and there's nothing there. And all the students are looking at me going, well, where is this thing? And I said, don't panic, it's all cool. Here's my exact words to them. I said, just look for the bunch of hippies and we'll follow them. Because I just assumed it's all the hippies that are into all that spirit soul body stuff, you know. I assumed it was just all the hippies. So I'm looking around for hippies. I can't find any hippies. But I start noticing mums and dads with little kids, middle class, upper class people, guys with briefcases, and they're all kind of walking in this one direction. So I said, come on, guys, let's just follow those guys and we'll see if... Just seemed to be a lot of them heading in one direction. So I ended up walking across the, 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 the bridge there over to South Bank and bang, there we were, convention centre. It was 20... 20 bucks, I think, to get a ticket to go in. But we had a pass because we had a little table in there. We went in there. And I've never been in an environment like it. There would have been, I reckon, 120 stalls. It was like being at the Easter show. And, and every stall had its show bags and everything. They were just giving them out for free and so on. But all of these stalls were psychic channelers, body aura readers, tarot card readers, there was even alien guys that was there talking, aliens, you know, come to me and I'll tell you what the aliens are saying, put this tin foil on your head and all that sort of stuff, you know. About 120. I watched, I watched the guy walk in and I didn't see him when he walked in, but I saw him on his way out and he came running past me. He'd been to one of the psychic readers or something and then he turned, he got out of his chair and he bolted, ran through the crowd, grabbing at his ears, screaming, saying, stop talking to me, stop talking to me and just ran off out into the street. There was so much spiritual activity and things going on in there. We had this little uh, uh, thing. And what we were doing is we were just praying for people. We just, we're just going to pray for you and prophesy over you if the Lord leads. And if you're sick, we want to pray. And, 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 and across from us over there was a table with a tarot card reader. And that guy had a lineup. A lineup where people would line up and they'd wait for at least an hour just to get to the table. That's how busy he was. He had about eight tables going. And this went on for two to three days. We, worked, we did the math. This guy brought in hundreds of thousands of dollars. We could not believe how much money he would have made because not only did they pay to get in, he was charging for a reading. The point was this. People were so spiritually hungry for something other than just another type of religion. There was a, there's a hunger. There's a hunger for something more than just people know inside their hearts there is something more to life. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, hey, I meet that need. I meet that need. I'm going to send my spirit. And my spirit's going to come. And it's going to dwell inside of you. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. He said, I'm going to take out your dead uh, 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 heart, heart of stone. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll take out your dead spirit and I'll give you a life spirit. And then I'll place my spirit in your spirit and I will cause you to walk in, your, in my ways. In other words, I will cause you, I will motivate you, I'll transform and change you from the inside and then you'll start to live the way that I want you to live, not in your own strength, but in the power of my Holy Spirit. 
Jesus said to the disciples, don't go and preach the gospel yet. Wait till you receive power from on high. Why? Because when you go out and what you're doing for me, you're going to do it in the power of the Spirit. You can't do it in your own strength. And I just wonder, I just wonder whether today, in 2024, do we still have that same inclination towards being led by the Spirit? Do we have that expectation in our day-to-day life that the Spirit wants to lead? And do we have the motivation to go, if you say it, Lord, I'm going to do it? Do we have that in 2024? Or is that the reason why today the church no longer can say, hey, we're turning the world upside down? Just stand with me this morning. I'm going to unpack those three things a little bit more next week. But I just want to encourage us. I don't know where you're at right now. If you're in this place and you do not know Jesus, you've never surrendered your life to Him. You've never bowed your knee to Him. You've never repented. And when the Bible talks about repenting of sin, the main sin it's talking about is not go through your life and find all the nitpicky individual things you did. The sin you're repenting of is of not living for God and making the decision to turn your life around and to follow after Jesus. If you've never made that decision, I want to encourage you today. You can make that decision today right now. And that spirit that we're talking about, Jesus said, if you make that decision, He said, that's the promise of that spirit becomes your promise and the Holy Spirit will come and take up residence in your life. And things that you maybe didn't understand about God before will start to make sense. A lot of things that you couldn't change, you'll be empowered to start to change and start to become and live the kind of life that God wants us to live. If you're here today and that's you, can I encourage you? Can I encourage you just in your heart right now? You can say, yes, Lord Jesus, that's me. And I want to give my life to you this morning. I want to open my heart up to you and I want to begin a new life with you. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me, Lord, for ignoring you all these years of my life. Today, I'll draw a line in the sand. Father, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to live for you. And if you're hearing, you are a believer. But maybe you realize, you know what? I, I ignore the Holy Spirit. I know I do. I know that I ignore the reality of the Spirit in my life. I want to encourage you and challenge you today. Would you rethink? Would you rethink the Holy Spirit's presence in your life? Would you rethink your relationship to that Spirit that Jesus gave and said, it's advantageous, it's great for you. I've given you my Spirit to walk with you. If you ignore that Spirit, can I challenge you this morning, would you stop ignoring the Holy Spirit of God? Father, I thank you for this morning, Lord. I thank you for your Word, God. Lord, I thank you for the truth of your Word. God, I thank you for the reality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the member of the Trinity that is down here, present with us right now. God, the Word of God tells us you are seated on the throne. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is here right now in this place. And we thank you for your presence, Lord. And I pray for each person here. Lord, as we go into the next seven days, the next week, that, Lord, we would just, we would start to stop a little bit and ask the question, Holy Spirit, where are you right now? What do, you, do you want to say something to me? Do you want to show me something? Do you want to reveal something to me? Do you want to do something in me or through me right now? I just pray that we would start to to take more awareness, God, of the Spirit's presence with us, Lord. Presence changes everything. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen.